I want to show you an example of how indirect proof is used in mathematics, partly because it illustrates the method and partly because it's so intrinsically interesting. In mathematics, indirect proof is often used to prove things that could not be proved directly. You know, in a direct proof, you start with premises and then you derive a conclusion from the premises uh, step by step. In an indirect proof, you take a detour before you get to the conclusion, and that's why it's called indirect proof. Here's an example of an indirect proof in mathematics. You start by stating what you seek to prove. We're going to prove that the square root of 2 is irrational. In order to prove that the square root of 2 is irrational, we're going to make an assumption. The assumption is going to be the logical opposite of what we seek to prove. We're going to assume that the square root of 2 is rational. Now, we're trying to prove that the square root of 2 is irrational, but we're going to assume the logical opposite, in a sense the negation of what we want to prove. We're going to assume the square root of 2 is rational. And so we begin with the definition of a rational number. A rational number is any number that can be represented as a ratio of two integers. So a rational number is a ratio number. Now, if the square root of 2 is indeed a rational number, a ratio number, then there must be a ratio that's equal to the square, of, square root of 2. In other words, there must be some a over b that's equal to the square root of 2, where a and b are two integers and they're mutually prime. The fraction has been reduced to its lowest common terms. That must follow if we do assume that the square root of 2 is rational. Now, since this is an equality, since a over b equals the square root of 2, um, it follows that if I perform the same operation on each side, the same mathematical operation on each side, the result will remain equal. You know, if you, if you do the same thing to both sides of an equality, what results remains equal. If I, uh, have, if I have two burritos and they're both equal, and I take an equal bite out of each one, then they remain equal in weight. And it's a basic logical idea. So I'm going to multiply each side of this equality by b, and what I will get is a equals the square root of 2 times b. I just multiplied each side by b. So if this was equal, this remains an equality as well. So now I know that a equals the square root of 2 times b, given my assumption. Now I'm going to, I'm going to um, square each side. And again, if I perform the same operation on each side, the result remains equal. So if I square each side, I get a squared equals 2b squared. This proves that a squared is an even number. Because, if a, if, because 2 is one of its factors. In other words, if a squared is twice some number, it must be that a squared is an even number, because an even number is, is a number that's twice some number. But if a squared is even, okay, so let me record that. So a squared must be even, but if a squared is even, a must be even as well. Because in general, if a number squared is even, then uh, the number must be even as well. If x squared is even, x has to be even. Any factor of a squared has to be a factor of a. So if 2 is a factor of a squared, 2 is a factor of a. If a is even, a squared is even, a is even. So now we've proven that a is even. Since a and b are mutually prime, it must be that b is odd. Because they can't both be even and be mutually prime. So now we've reached a, the, an interesting result. We've proven, assuming that the square root of 2 is rational, that a is even and b is odd. Now, since a is an even number, we know it's twice some number, but we don't know which number it is. But let's let 
a equal the quantity 2c, where c is that number which, when multiplied by 2, equals a. I can make this assumption because I know a is an even number, so I know it's twice some number. I'm just letting that number be c. So we know that a is twice some number c. I'm going to replace a in this, e excuse me, in this equality. I'm going to replace a with 2c. So I'm going to rewrite this equality as uh, replacing a with 2c. So 2c squared equals 2b squared. So now I know this is equal if this, if this is equal. So multiplying this out, of course, I get 4c squared equals 2b squared. If I divide each side in half, we still have an equality. So let's divide each side in half. 2c squared equals b squared. Hmm. So b squared has 2 as one of its factors. In other words, b squared is twice some number. But that means that b squared is even, doesn't it? But any factor of b squared is a factor of b. So if b squared is even, if b squared has 2 as one of its factors, certainly b must be even. It must also have 2 as a factor. And so b must be even too. So look what we've done. We started by assuming the square root of 2 is rational. And using just the definition of what it means to be rational, for a number to be rational, we've logically derived a contradiction. Because we derived that b is odd, and that b is even. In other words, we've derived a contradiction of the form p, and it's not the case that p. And that shows that the assumption must be contradictory. Because, again, in general, if p logically implies q, and q is a contradiction, then p has to be a contradiction, too. Because only a contradiction can logically imply, imply a contradiction. So our assumption now has been shown to be contradictory because it logically implies a contradiction. We can validly derive a contradiction from the assumption by these steps, each of which is valid. If the assumption's contradictory, it has to be false because contradictions are the paradigm of the false. And so then the logical opposite of our assumption must be true because true is the logical opposite of falsity. And therefore, through an indirect route, first by making an assumption and testing that assumption, we have shown that the assumption must be false because it's contradictory, and therefore that its opposite, what we originally sought to prove, must be true. And so this proves that the square root of 2 indeed must be irrational, can't be rational, can't possibly be rational on pain of a contradiction. And so this is called an indirect proof. In mathematics, mathematicians usually call this a proof by contradiction. But in logic, we generally call it an indirect proof. And in the Middle Ages, this kind of a proof was given a Latin name in the universities of Europe, and it still has that name, reductio ad absurdum. That is Latin for reduced to absurdity. And so in the Middle Ages and the universities of Europe, logicians would use this method of proof and call it reduced to absurdity or reduction to absurdity. And using this method of proof, they would uh, take their oppos opponent's position and assume it and then try to show that their opponent's position logically lo implies a contradiction. And if they started with their opponent's opposing view and showed that it implied a contradiction, it would be said that the opponent's view had been reduced to an absurdity because it had been shown to imply a contradiction, which is an absurdity. And so the, the name of this method in the Middle Ages became reductio ad absurdum. But today we generally call it the indirect proof method, and that's a beautiful example in mathematics. But I'd like to close this little episode with a kind of a short common sense application. Suppose someone says, there's a largest number, there's a largest whole number. 
Here's a neat little indirect proof that shows that's impossible. So suppose someone says there's a largest whole number, we'll call it x. x is the largest number there is. But assuming that x is the largest number, we can show a contradiction follows from that. Because it's easy to define a number x plus 1, which is the number x with 1 added to it. So assuming that x is the largest number, there's no number larger than x. But the number x plus 1 would be larger than x. And so therefore there's no number larger than x, and there is a number larger than x. That's a contradiction. So assuming that x is the largest number, we've derived a contradiction from it using steps that are unfaultable. And so we've reduced the assumption to an absurdity. We've proven it's false by contradiction. We've given an indirect proof that there can't be a largest number, call it x. So indirect proof, it's a neat rule of, of logic, and I hope you like it. Thank you for your time.